for you guys. Um, first of all, I just want to introduce myself. My name is Amber, and if I haven't gotten the chance to meet you, I would love to meet you in the lobby after service. Um, so yeah, a couple quick announcements. Um, we have this lovely app called the Church Center app, and if you want to get involved with the Front Church or just want to know more events that are happening, download the app, scan the QR code with your phone, down it, download it, and you'll be connected. Speaking of the Church Center app, another thing that you can do on the Church Center app is get connected with the community group. And if any of you are in a community group, and I see some faces, it is the best part of my week, to be completely honest. So we just want to encourage you guys to join the community group because we just want to be a community embedded in Christ together. Um, when you walk in, you probably notice these little cards sitting on your chairs. Um, fill those out if it's your first time here. You can drop it off in the lobby and you'll get a free gift from us, which is super, super cool and fun and awesome. So, uh, all the announcements, but if this is your first time at the Front Church, again, we just want to welcome you. And then we're going to go back into a time of worship. So we have three more songs. We'll hear a 30-minute message from Pastor Nate, and then we'll close with one more song. Welcome to the front, everybody. And Cam, take it away. Thanks, Amber. Hey, what's up, guys? My name is Cam. I'm the worship leader here at the Front Church. It's good to see you guys all here this morning. Uh, I want us to introduce our band this morning. We got Jason all the way over there on the bass. We got Shelly behind the keys. We got Emily next to me on vocals. And we got Andrew on the drums. Uh, so yeah, without further ado, let's everyone please stand if you are able. And let's continue to sing with the uh,
of this next song. It's called uh, None But Jesus. And uh, there are a couple lyrics that, uh, that, put that or I guess, stood out to me, and I wanted to share with you. It's uh, the first part of verse 2, and it goes, In the chaos, in the confusion, I know you're sovereign still. And in the moment of my weakness, you give me grace to do your will. And, um, I think for a lot of us, it, it can feel chaotic. It can feel confusing um, in our life, or we can feel weak. We can feel powerless. Um, and so I'd like us to sing this song um, to, to just proclaim the, the sovereignty of Jesus and the, the power that, that God has, um, and that no one but Jesus would carry our burdens with us. No one but Jesus um, will save us. Save ourselves, save this community, save our world. And so, um, yeah, let's sing this song together as a church.
for a minute. I feel like um, before we kind of jump into where we're headed this morning, uh, I feel like it's appropriate for us to just take a collective breath together um, and spend our, a few minutes in prayer. Um, I don't know what you're bringing in this morning, but it can feel a lot of times like we're caught in the middle of a storm, right? Um, I found out some stormy news uh, this week. Uh, I found it out last night. Um, there's a family that we raised a lot of money for um, to, because they had a devastating cancer diagnosis. And uh, we, we raised a lot of money to, to bless them over Christmas. 
And then uh, uh, about a month ago, Jason got his scans back and he was completely cancer free. And we were so excited about that. And then um, uh, Friday night, he had a seizure. And last night, he's in the hospital and had a new scan. And um, um, he, has can he has a brain tumor, um, which really, really stinks. Um, some of you may know Jason, some of you may not. Some of you may just know people like Jason. Some of you might feel like Jason right now. It's just like life just keeps bearing down on you. The storm, the onslaught feels like it keeps coming. And so I just want to take a moment to pray for Jason and to pray for those of us in the room that might be feeling that as well this morning. Jesus, we come to you. Some of us with a burden very, very heavy. And we need you to carry it. We need you to be our life when it feels like death and darkness all around us. We need you to meet us this morning, right now. Surprise us this morning. Meet us, Jesus. Please, Jesus. And as Shelly's going to play a little bit longer... The other thing we got going on in our world right now is we got this Russia-Ukraine situation going on. And um, um, I thought that it would, I thought we needed to take a minute to pray for peace. And sometimes with prayer, we like don't know what to pray. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, it's like, you know, you just, you can't even like figure out the words to form to pray the thing that you want to pray. And so actually I found the Psalms to be really helpful because the Psalms are kind of like scripted prayers that help us know what to pray if we don't know what to pray and they're pretty raw. Um, sometimes the church throughout its history is also scripted prayers to just help us kind of guide our prayer. And so I ran across this prayer this week from Justin Welby, who's the Archbishop of Can Canterbury. And... Um, I thought that we would use this prayer um, to kind of guide our hearts as we pray for peace in this situation. So I'm just going to pray it a line at a time, and I'm going to move slowly so that your heart can pray it with, um, with me and that we can pray together. So let's pray. God of peace and justice, We pray for the people of Ukraine today. We pray for peace and the laying down of weapons. We pray for all those who fear tomorrow that your spirit of comfort would draw near to them. We pray for those with power over war or peace, for wisdom, discernment, and compassion to guide their decisions. And above all, we pray for all your precious children at risk and in fear. that you would hold and protect them. We pray in the name of Jesus, the Prince of Peace. Amen. Oh man, anyone anyway, I'm just I'm just feeling heavy this morning. And that's okay. That's what we're going to be talking about. So we're going to be just fine. Uh, last week, we kicked off a series on values, 
Values help answer the question, who are we becoming? We started 2022 by going through our value. We want to be community formed by Jesus's story. We spent six weeks on that value, and now we're going to spend the next few weeks on the other four values that we have at the front. Last week, we talked about being renewed to participate in Jesus's story. Um, we, one of our values is inviting as many people as possible to experience Jesus' story. One of our values is worshiping because of Jesus' story. And the value we're going to be talking about this morning is hearing Jesus' story. Now, how, how do we hear Jesus' story? Well, Sundays, church on Sundays, that's a great way to hear Jesus' story. Community groups, where we gather in a community, we... Um, we, we Part of the reason that we gather in a community group is to remind one another of Jesus's story. Oh, we hear Jesus' story by reading uh, our, our Bibles, the, the scriptures. Uh, we hear Jesus' story. This is, this is like a cheat. It's not a cheat. It's a really great idea. But it's also a cheat if you don't consider yourself very biblically literate or you're like trying to figure out the Bible or learn the Bible. Read Bible stories to your kids. We read Bible stories to our kids every night. And, and you know what? It's not just for them. They, they, they might think it is. It's not. It's not just for them. There's a bunch of ways that we want to incorporate in our lives, ways that we are hearing Jesus' story. And the gospel accounts, that's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, are the biographies of Jesus that we have in our Bibles. And so these are the primary, these are the Jesus story texts. And so that's a great place to start. If you never read the Bible before, you, you move about three quarters of the way back, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And each one of them is a, a biography of Jesus told from a slightly different perspective because it's written to a slightly different audience. And so um, th those are great places to start if you don't know where to read or how to read the Bible. Start there. Now, um, the, the rest of the Bible is important too. But the rest of the Bible kind of sets up Jesus. The Old Testament is important because it lays the groundwork and the framing story that then the Jesus story makes a lot more sense when we have it. It pops. We can learn a lot about who God is, about who God's people are called to be. We can learn a lot cruising through the Old Testament. And then the New Testament, after the Gospels, that's all the church trying to figure out what it looks like to live in light of Jesus' story. So they're just wrestling through, okay, well, this is the story. Okay, what does that mean for us? What does that mean for us individually? What does that mean for us in community? And so that's kind of how the Bible works. But the dead center of the Bible is Jesus. It's what the whole thing was setting up is about and is, and is being worked out after Word. Will the Bible make sense when we read it? Will it all make sense? No, a lot of it won't. We're all kind of figuring it out. We're all learning how to make sense of us. We don't need to be experts when you pick up your Bible. The, now, the more you kind of learn, the, the more helpful it can become. But anyone can do it, and anyone can pick up one of the gospel accounts and read it and begin to put it together. And so St. Augustine um, who lived in the fourth century, once said, I love this quote, since Jesus is the word made flesh, Jesus is a word made flesh, every one of his actions is also a word, that is to say a revelation of some abiding and universal spiritual truth. What's he saying there? He's saying when we read the gospels and we read the stories of Jesus, it's not just telling us something that Jesus did, there's a spiritual truth to be discovered, to be dug into there that has universal application, has universal principles. And so this is an art as we're reading the story of Jesus, as we're hearing the story of Jesus. It's an art. It's a practice to learn how to dig these out and then live by them. And so I figure what we're going to do this morning is we're going to look at part of Jesus' story and we're going to kind of see how does it work. How does it work? to hear Jesus's story. And we're going to attempt to hear it together this morning. And again, you, you can do this in your community groups. You can do this at home. You can do this with your kids. We're just going to try and do it together this morning. And so scripture will be on the screen. 
but you can also open or turn on your Bibles to the Gospel of Luke. Luke is, again, about just past three quarters of the way back in my Bible. The Gospel of Luke, chapter 8, big number 8. Now, if you don't know anything about the Bible and you're here this morning, this is the perfect church for you. Because we really try and talk about the Bible in a way that makes sense, in a way that everyone can understand. Again, if it's really fresh, then are you going to be able to understand it all? Is anyone? No, but that's okay. We're, pe- we're going to try and talk in a way that's easily understood. We're going to try and talk in a way that you can begin to put the pieces together. But Luke chapter 8 is where we're going this morning. Luke chapter 8, and we're going to start in verse 22. One day Jesus said to his disciples, let us go over to the other side of the lake. So they got into a boat and set out. And as they sailed, Jesus fell asleep and a squall came down on the lake so that the boat was being swamped and they were in great danger. And the disciples went and woke him saying, master, master, We're going to drown. Anyone been a little overwhelmed by a storm in their life? Yes. Master, we're going to drown. So Jesus got up and he rebuked the wind and the raging waters. And the storm subsided and all was calm. Where is your faith? Jesus asked his disciples. And in fear and amazement, they ask one another, who is this? He commands even the winds and the water, and they obey him. Luke, when he's writing his gospel, gets a little bit of freedom in figuring out how he's going to arrange certain parts. And he puts this part right in front of another stormy story that we're going to read about in a second. But I think this story has a lot to say to us if you feel like you're in a storm right now. Now, maybe it's the cancer diagnosis. Maybe it's just the relationship that's just going south. It's just gone awry. You've tried and you've tried and you've tried and you've tried, and it just feels like there's no light at the end of the tunnel. Maybe it's just, maybe you're a college student and you're so swamped with, tr- with homework and you're trying to get good grades and you don't know where the time's going to come to spend time with people and you're getting more and more lonely and you're feeling more and more alone. I don't know, it's different storms. Maybe it's a global storm. I feel like we're in a global storm right now where it's like, what is going to happen I thought that these kind of concerns were concerns my parents had to worry about in the 80s and 70s. And now we're, are we back? I don't know. I don't know. But we can glean a couple truths out of this story right away. One, if you're in Jesus' boat, you're going to be all right. You don't have to be a Bible expert to pull that one out. You can read this story and you can know. If I'm in Jesus' boat, I'm going to be all right. Another thing we can glean, Jesus has power over the storm. We want to try and learn how to hear Jesus' story, because this story has changed the world. This story is not just this, not just this particular story, but the whole story of Jesus has literally turned the world upside down. We sometimes don't understand that like a lot of our values, a lot of the things we take for granted, a lot of the, 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 the fact that all humans are worthy of dignity and respect and honor, this kind of innate, like, of course that's a value, of course that's universally true. We didn't get that from Rome. Rome didn't think that way in the first century. We didn't get that from, from Sparta. We got that from Jesus. In Rome, they put each other in coliseums and watch people kill each other for fun. That, that was just entertainment. They, had, they, they, they didn't see any reason to stoop down and serve one another beneath your social class. 
the, the values that we've inherited are the result of the Jesus story literally turning the world upside down. But we work to hear this. Now let's go a little deeper, okay? Maybe you don't know the Bible that well. That's fine. You could have gleaned those two things right away. Well, let's take it a step further. And let's look at the, the water thing going on in the story. There's a storm happening. In the book of Genesis, which is literally like the first book of your Bible, the very beginning, there's a creation story. And in the creation story, in the book of Genesis, it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And what happens over the waters? God says, dry land, come up. And dry land appears. And it says that God gathered the waters and he called them seas. S-E-A-S, like a sea, like the great sea, seas. That's the very beginning of your Bible. If you cruise to the very end, Revelation chapter 21, there's a really curious thing that happens. This is at the very end. This is anticipating the day when Jesus makes all things new, when all the sad things come, on, uh, come untrue. As, was that Samwise that asked Gandalf that question in Lord of the Rings? But this is the part. This is the moment in the Bible story. This is the moment we anticipate in the future where all the sad things come untrue. And the Apostle John writes, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. That's really weird. No sea? What's up with that? Like, well, if you keep reading, you see that there's water. There's a river running through the city. So he's not saying there's no water. So what's the deal with the sea? There's no sea. The sea is gone. Here's the deal. In Jewish first century thought, the sea sea came to symbolize all the dark forces that were trying to thwart God's will for his people and his creation. They came to symbolize and epitomize all the things that are up against the power of God, that are up against God doing what he wants to do. It came to symbolize these dark forces. And so at the and the, John is telling us in Revelation, one day that's going to be no more. So now let's take that to the next level. The disciples are like, who is this that can speak to the sea and it listens? Something bigger is going on here. The one who is actually bigger than the forces of darkness, bigger than the death, bigger than all the things that are up against God's plan for his people and his creation, that one is here now and something different is happening. If you ever feel like you're in a storm, Jesus allows him to be in the storm, but they're in his boat and he's got power over the storm. Let's go to the next storm. So if you keep going in Luke 8, we're just gonna keep reading. So they sailed to the region of the Gerasenes, which is across the lake from Galilee. And when Jesus stepped ashore, he was met by a demon-possessed man from the town. For a long time, this man had not worn clothes or lived in a house, but he lived in the tombs. And when he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell at his feet, shouting at the top of his voice, what do you want with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? I beg you, don't torture me. For Jesus had commanded the impure spirit to come out of the man. And many times it had seized him. And though he was chained hand and foot and kept under guard, he had broken his chains and had been driven by the demon into solitary places. So Jesus asked him, what's your name? Legion, he replies, because many demons had gone into him, and they begged Jesus repeatedly not to order them to go into the abyss. So a large herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside, and the demons begged Jesus to let them go into the pigs, and he gave them permission. And when the demons came out of the man, they went into the pigs, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and was drowned. What a sight. Um, 
But when those tending the pigs saw what had happened, they ran off and reported this in the town and the countryside. And the people went out to see what had happened. And when they came to Jesus, they found the man from whom the demons had gone out, sitting at Jesus' feet, dressed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. And those who'd seen it told the people how the demon-possessed man had been cured. And then all the people of the region of the Gerasenes asked Jesus to stay with them forever because of all the good things he did for this man. No, they asked him to leave because they were overcome with fear. So he got into the boat and left. And the man from whom the demons had gone out begged to go with Jesus, but Jesus sent him away saying, return home and tell how much God has done for you. So the man went away and told all over town how much Jesus had done for him. If you ever feel like you're in a storm, you're in good company. This man was in a storm. He knew he was in a storm. And I bet the disciples, when they get off the boat and they see this guy running towards them and they're putting two and two together real quick, he's not dressed, he looks crazy, He's coming from a graveyard. I bet they feel like they're about to get another storm too. But the dark powers have overtaken this man. And this, in this man, what we see is we see an extreme example of what the dark powers want to do to you. In this man, we see an extreme example about what the dark powers want to do to our world. To destroy to bring chaos, to bring death. And this man is simply the, a picture of the end of where a life without God will lead us. If we're not in Jesus' boat, the sea will consume us and we need rescue. Now this story feels a little funny because it talks about demons. We're not too comfortable talking about demons in the West. I'm not too comfortable talking about demons, if I'm being entirely honest. But I've had to face a reality, and maybe you guys need to face this reality too. I have realized that sometimes we can think, well, we're beyond those sort of superstitions. Like, we, we, don't, we don't believe that sort of stuff anymore. I've realized that is a cultural, that is cultural snobbery. There are plenty of places all around the world where this is a, this is just, they understand this. There's nothing off-putting about this story. They get these realities. In fact, I was once in Taiwan on a mission trip. I shared a story from the Gospels that I found particularly meaningful to me for, for a particular reason. And then afterward, the missionaries talked to me and they said, you know, they didn't really get your point because they were too caught up in the demon stuff because that's real for them. Oh, Oh, okay. There's, this story may shock our sensibilities, but it's not as shocking to the sensibilities of many around the world. There are dark powers whose desire it is to thwart God's plan for you, to thwart God's plan in his world, and to thwart God's plan for his people. And is this man's storm, Jesus rescues him from the dark powers. The sea that threatens to consume him, Jesus reaches down and pulls him out. And then it's super cool because there's this herd of pigs and in Jewish thought, pigs were thought to be unclean. So this man was thought to be unclean because of all his craziness, living among graves and uh, uh, his sort of stuff. But then pigs were thought to be unclean for Jewish people. And so Jesus goes one step further. Not only does he cleanse this man, not only does he deliver him from the dark forces and the dark powers, but he symbolically cleanses the region. He's like, okay, take the pigs. And the pigs are gone. This whole mass of uncleanness, gone. And now this symbolically clean area. This man's delivered from the dark powers, but you know who aren't, who are taken by the dark powers in the story? The townspeople. Now they don't look crazy. 
They look pretty sane. But you know what dark powers got them? They didn't care about the guy that was restored and rescued. They cared about the money they lost with the pigs that went into the sea. They prized money over people. Man, Jesus gets in the way of your money. Jesus gets in the way of your normal. They had a normal. This guy lived over there. We live over here. Dark powers. These dark powers are just a little more sneaky for these guys. And I think these sneaky dark powers we're a little more familiar with in our own lives. Look at how this story ends one more time. Chapter 8, verse 38 and 39. The man from whom the demons had gone out begged to go with him, but Jesus sent him away saying, return home and tell how much God has done for you. So the man went away and told all over town how much Jesus had done for him. You see what the gospel writer Luke, he's including this story because he wants us to hear Jesus' story. And what is so true about Jesus' story is that God is Jesus. Jesus is God took on flesh. And so, and, and Luke is trying to tell us this because Jesus tells the guy, go tell everyone what God did for you. And this guy t- goes and tells everyone what Jesus did for him. Now, I always thought it strange. I'm like, Jesus, why not let this guy come with you? Here's why I think, though. I think Jesus doesn't want the dark powers that have taken the community to keep taking the community. So what's he do? He puts a walking, talking reminder of Jesus' power in their community to cruise around and tell everyone about Jesus. There can be a new way. There can be a new way of life. There can be a new rescue. You, it, money's, money's not going to save you. There can be life with God. A walking, talking icon of the power of Jesus cruising around the community owned by the dark forces. If you ever feel like you're in a storm, if you're in Jesus' boat, you're going to be all right. And Jesus has power over the storm. Now, hearing Jesus' story, this has the power to shape us. This has shaped the world. This has changed the world. This has the power to transform us. This has the power to make us new. This is a story that we need to bring to mind again and again. That's why we hear it on Sundays. That's why we hear it in community groups. That's why we read the scriptures during the week. That's why I read Bible stories to our kids, because I forget it all the time. I forget all the time the truth of who Jesus is. The truth of who we are because of who Jesus is. The truth of what Jesus has done in the world. It has changed the world. Now, will we be experts with Jesus' story? No, but we practice. Isn't practice a wonderful word? Like, that's all Jesus is inviting his disciples to do over and over again when they're following him. Because they screw things up all the time, which should make us feel really great. Because we screw things up all the time. But as they're screwing things up, Jesus invites them to practice again what it means to be his people, what it means to follow him, what it means to come to him. He doesn't keep them at a distance. He's always bringing them in. And the God, Jesus, who knows about the seas, he knows about the dark powers. He knows about the storms of our lives. And he wants you to know he's not far. I got one more story this morning. If you feel like you're in a storm, I am saying this as lovingly as possible. I hear this as a place of deep care and compassion. If you're not in Jesus' boat, you're in imminent danger. Because there are powers that want to wreck your life. There are also powers that just want to trick you to live in for the wrong thing. 
They just want to trick you to live for the wrong thing and the wrong reasons. And you're in imminent danger of wasting your life. And you're in imminent danger of losing your life. But our God is not a God unaware of the danger we face without him. One more story. Here it is. There's a time when Jesus lets the storm win. He doesn't calm the storm. There's a time where Jesus lets the storm rage and rage and rage and rage. And it's on his cross when he's hanging up there and the storm and the dark powers are coming with all they got. They're coming. He could have called and said, get me out of here, Father. He let the storm win. Why does he let the storm win? He lets the storm overtake him so that the storm doesn't overtake you. That's what he's doing on the cross. Jesus lets the powers play their very worst. They're coming at him full force. And if you ever feel like the powers are coming at you full force, if you ever feel like you can't see light at the end of the tunnel, if you ever feel like you don't know how anything good can come out of this, if you ever feel that, you know what? He let, he's been there. He let it all come raging down. It all came pouring down on him on the cross. And then he was buried and it looked like the powers won. But they didn't win. Three days later, he was raised to life. Three days later, that was victory. That was God's proclaimed victory. That no storm, no dark force, no dark power can ever, will ever ultimately thwart God's plan for his people and his new creation. New creation is coming. It's coming. And one day, there will be no more sea. They'll be gone. How do you get in Jesus' boat? I think you got to acknowledge, if you're not in Jesus' boat, you got to know that the sea is going to consume you. But getting in Jesus' boat ain't complicated. It just starts with Jesus, I need you. He's not far. Jesus came to remove the barrier that stood between our relationship with God. He's taking care of all that. The thing that gets you in Jesus' boat is confessing your need for him. That's it. That's it. Jesus, the storm, it's coming for us. It's going to get us. Jesus, the storm is coming for me. It's going to get me. I need you. That's all you got to do. You say, Jesus, I need you. And you get in Jesus' boat. Doesn't mean you're not going to go through storms. It means you're going to be all right. And it means that one day there will be no more sea. He has power over that storm. Let's pray. Jesus, it can feel like we're in a storm. And we need you. Oh, God, we need you. Maybe you're in the room right now, heads bowed and eyes closed, and you... No, those dark powers have been coming for you. And you want to experience Jesus' life. You want to invite Jesus into your life. You want to say, Jesus, I need you. Jesus, I want to be in your boat. If that's you this morning, you can pray the simple prayer in your heart, in the quiet of your heart, with me right now. Jesus, what I've been doing hasn't been working. You died on the cross for me. You were raised to life for me. 
I need you. Come into my life. If you pray a prayer like that, you are in Jesus' boat. You are in Jesus' boat. Jesus, we give this time to you. In your name, amen. If you are able, please join us in standing one last time as we close in worship.
remind you again about community groups. You can join a community group by downloading the Church Center app. Um, and if you feel uh, called to give today, you can go to the Front Church's website and click on Give or text 84321 um, to the Front Church. Thank you guys so much for being here this Sunday. We really appreciate it. We hope you have a great week, and we'll see you next week. Welcome to the Front Church.